Well, good afternoon. We're looking at piecewise and quadratic functions today. And first, we want to remind you what a function is. The last time during that horrible class where the computer kept cutting off, we said a function is a rule which assigns each x value exactly one or one and only one y value. The set of x values is the domain. The set of y values is the range. We said you could have a graph as just a list of ordered pairs. No, you mean a function as a I mean a function as a list of ordered pairs. And uh, if you think of it as ordered pairs, then a function is a set of ordered pairs with no repeated x values. Okay? If there's repeated x's, it's not a function. If there's repeated y's, then that's okay. We also said, okay, if you have a graph, you can tell if the gra a graph is a function by manual zooming out and by looking at a vertical line, if the graph intersects a vertical line more than once, then that means that there's repeated x's. So a circle is not a function. A slanted line is a function. And uh, by looking at a graph, you decide if it's uh, on the domain and range by asking yourself, is it going left and right forever? If it goes left and right forever, then the domain is all real numbers. Up and down, though, it's the y values, that's the range. If it's going up and down forever, then the range is all real numbers. And we write all real numbers as negative infinity to infinity. Like here on this one, it's not moving uh, left forever. It's moving right forever. So on the domain, it starts at negative 3 and keeps going to the right, so to infinity. But for the range, is it moving up and down forever, this graph here? It sure is. Okay, so it's going down and it's going up forever. Number five. Am I beating a dead horse, Tim? I should move on. Yeah, okay. Right. Okay, so time to start a new type of function. New to y'all, not new to the world of math. So we're going to first look at something called a piecewise function. A piecewise function is a function whose rule is broken into several pieces. And we're going to start with problem number two in the homework. That'll show you what a piecewise function looks like. It says for the piecewise function, notice how the function rule is broken into three different pieces here. That's different from the way the function, uh, when we wrote them as equations, looked the last time. Okay? Let me write this function down. I'm going to color code each piece. Notice they're using the letter H instead of an F. Most of the time F is used for function, but it doesn't have to be. So H of X equals negative 5X minus 19 for X values less than negative 6. I'll discuss what this means in a moment. Then the middle piece says just a 5 for negative 6 less than or equal to x less than 5. And finally x plus 3 is the third piece for x is greater than or equal to 5. You know, I should have gone ahead and just kept on uh, doing what I was doing, going through all of this because stuff we're going to be using. Uh, Last time, this little function notation, 
Remember how we did that? Remember inside the parentheses, you plug in for x, that gives you the y value, but you can only have one y value. You can't have two or three y values. So when we look at this problem number two, it says find h of negative eight. Well, the last time we said, okay, to find something like that, it's easy, you just plug the number in. But wait a minute, which one do we plug in? You can't plug the negative eight in to each one of these pieces. For every x value, there can only be one y value. So which one of these are we gonna plug into? Well, that's what this part over here comes in. We're gonna use the blue rule. You plug into the blue one, Whenever you have an x value that's less than negative 6, we'll use the red rule whenever, instead of reading this as negative 6 less than or equal to x less than 5, whenever you see two less thans or two greater thans in the same statement, start in the middle and then say between. The red rule we'll use whenever the x value is between negative six and five. The purple rule, oh, that doesn't look purple to me, it looks black, but we'll pretend it's, it is purple. We'll use the purple rule whenever the x value is greater than or equal to five. So what do we, which one are we gonna plug into? Here's my x value. We're finding h of negative eight. Is our x value less than negative six? between negative six and five, or bigger than five? Mm, it's a negative eight, not a positive eight. I'm thinking it's less than negative six. If we plug the neg uh, if we look at this negative eight, it's smaller than negative six. So this blue rule is the one we're gonna plug into. In place of the blue x, We'll put a negative 8. And what blue number am I going to get here? Hmm, let me see. Maybe I need my... There. Negative 5 times negative 8 is positive 40. Minus 19. What's 40 minus 19? 21. So there's my first answer, h of negative eight. You see, the last time we were just plugging in. You take the number, you plug it in for x. What's different this time? You've got to decide where do you plug it in? The blue piece, the red piece, or the purple piece? So I'll type in 21 as my first answer. Now it says find h of 3. Hmm, let me write that down. Y'all be thinking about which piece we're going to be looking at. The, the blue, the red, or the purple? Hmm, let's see. Find h of 3. Well, you can't have three answers. For every x, there can only be one y. You can't plug it into all three of these. So plug it. Which one do I look at? Look at over here. Is my three less than negative six? Between negative six and five. Yeah, that's between three is between negative six and five. So now this is going to be so easy it seems tricky to plug in the three. You come over here to the red piece of the function and replace every x with three. Well, there are no x's, so we're just going to have a red 5. That's called a constant function. This red piece, it never changes. Every y value between negative 6 and 5 is going to be a 5. You see where I'm getting this 5 here? There's no x to plug into. You want to type in 5 for me? Sure. All right. 
Oh. Jennifer? Okay. Who said O? Oh? You hit it? Oh, okay. Oh, H of 5. Oh, look at this one. H of 5. Hmm. Well, this is your X value. Is our X value less than si negative 6? Between negative 6 and 5, we'll notice there's, no there's not equality. an equal sign there. But here, okay, this is the one where x could actually equal 5. So plugging into the purple one. 8, I agree. 5 plus 3. 8. I'm sorry about that. Oh, yeah, let me be sparkling. What about H of 7? H of 7. Where would that go? Is 7 less than negative 6? Between negative 6 and 5? Or bigger than 5? It's here with this purple one. So in place of the purple X, I'm going to put the 7. Plus three, what am I going to type in as my answer? Ten. Ten. Okay. We do two things with piecewise functions. We evaluate them. That's what we're doing here. They give us plug a function, in. and we're figuring out which piece to plug the number into, okay? That's evaluating. That's pretty straightforward. Any questions there? Let's, I'm going to make up two. It just seemed like it went straight I know, through. I know. I was going to say. How about, two, I was going to say H of zero. Okay. I was going to say H of negative 10. But okay. Okay. H, of, H of negative 10. Let's find H of negative 10. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which one would I plug into? Negative 10. Negative 10, not positive 10. Is negative 10 less than negative 6? Is it between negative 6 and positive 5, or is negative 10 bigger than 5? The first one, okay. So it's negative 5 times negative 10 minus 19. The negative 5 times negative 10 is 50. Minus 19. What's that going to be? Uh, is that a 31? Yeah, I have to type that in. And what about your H of zero? Yeah, what about H of zero? Just a little extra practice of plugging in. Which one would I plug into there? To find H of zero. Blue, red, or purple? Okay. Say so between. Zero is between, oh, between. negative six and negative positive five. five. Mm -hmm. So what's the y value going to be? Five. Just a, five. that red five. Yeah. Right. What about h of a hundred? And then we'll stop beating this horse. That's all we're doing is just beating dead horses today. I emailed. Okay. So okay. 100 plus three. 100 is bigger than five. So 100 plus 5 is 103. No, 100 plus 3. Or 100 plus 3 is 103. Okay. Oh, I didn't circle the 5. Any questions there? The fun part of piecewise functions is graphing them. Mm -hmm. If you can imagine graphing this function, we'll have a blue graph a red graph and a purple graph all on the same axis, all on the same graph. And, that and realize it can't, it has to pass the vertical line test because it's a function. Mm -hmm. And so you can't have one piece over another piece. It's the graph we get is still going to uh, uh, pass that vertical line test. Let's and we're going to plot points. Six. We're going to plot points to draw these graphs, but we're going to plot points intelligently. We're not just going to start doing what they're doing here, sort of just randomly, randomly. choosing x values. 
Do you want me to take over for a moment? I can do this. Oh, I like the way it's not it's showing, not showing the, all the graphs. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Oh, they do not have a piecewise function built into yeah. piecewise function graphing tool built into uh, uh, this uh, college algebra course. So for piecewise functions, we're just going to draw them on paper, and then we'll choose the graph that looks the most like what we got. Okay. So we're going to graph it on paper and then pick the correct graph. I'll find it. Tell me what you can do. Yeah. Okay. Oh, what order did I go? Red was in the middle. I'll go negative two. Yes. Now, how am I going to read this? I'm not going to say if negative four is less than or equal to five, uh, x is less than or equal to five. I say what? If x is between negative 4 and positive 5, including both negative 4 and positive 5. No, I, would say, I, I think we already have an if there, okay? We have so the I'll, red rule if x is between negative 4, oh, and positive 5. I'm pointing and stuff, Tim. Right. Let's switch to you. Okay. okay. So, f of x equals negative 2x if, or 4, either word, x is between negative 4 and uh, positive 5. Right. We're going to graph these things by plotting points, mm -hmm. but we're going to plot points intelligently. We're yes. going to make... Oh, oh, I think we have a question. Question. So that was, the one that we just did was all number three, right? No, number two. Number, number two. two. And then we didn't go over the graph part, right? No. Well, it, it there was not say to graph it. Okay, number so two, so all so number six is the one. Number six is okay, the graphing like, one. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to okay. write that. Yeah. Graph. Like I something. Uh, no. So now we're showing you how to graph number six. It. Number uh, problem six is to show you how to graph one of these. And okay. The difference between number two and six is. Number two, and we're number two is showing you how to plug in. Number six is showing you how to graph it. Okay. But okay. it can be for or in. Yeah, either or. Okay. Or sometimes, depending on just how lazy, sometimes they just put a comma here and don't say if or for. Okay. 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 The important thing is you just got to have something with X's over here to the left. I mean, excuse me, on the right. Whether it says... I could just put a comma there and put X less than negative 4 and uh, X greater than 5 and X between negative 4 and positive 5. Okay, so it doesn't have to say... These conditions here are the ones that say what you use or help you decide which piece you're using. We're going to plot this using, uh, I mean, graph it by plotting points, but we're going to plot the points intelligently. We're not just going to start randomly choosing x values. For the lack of a better term, I'm going to call these numbers where the pieces change cut points. The blue piece changes to the red piece at negative 4. So I'll think a negative 4 is a cut point. The red piece changes to the purple piece at 5. So I'll think of 5 as a cut point. I'm going to say I have two different cut points here. I'm going to stick negative all four. these numbers and say cut points. Okay. Y equals 3 plus 2X. We know that that's uh, going to be a line. We, just have, we don't have a square root. We don't have a X squared. That would be a parabola. But y equals 3 plus 2x. y equals mx plus b. That's a line. What about y equals negative 2x? Is that a line? What's, 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 what's the question? I'm sorry. Is this piece here going to be a line? If there's a no piece x of a line. component and no square root, what did we say the graph was? If there's, yeah, if there's only one, then it's a line. Okay. A line. So all three of these are going to be pieces yeah. of lines. And they're all going to be on the same graph. How many points do you need in order to draw a line? What's the minimum number of points? One. No, you have to have two. Two ordered pairs uniquely determine oh, a line. Okay, two ordered pairs. 
Okay. Two, two points. I'm going to make my first table. Now, I'm going to number these pieces. To me, the blue piece, I'm going to make a blue table. The red piece, I'll make a red table. The purple piece, I'll make a purple table. But y'all are doing this all in one color, so I recommend... Black and white on that table. They are. So I make a note. Here's piece one. Here's piece two. Here's piece three. And we're going to make... This is table one. The first number you must plug in for X is any cut point that appears within the inequality. Well, I see a cut point right there, negative 4. I have to plug that into the blue piece. You may be thinking, but wait a minute, there's no equality. That's fine. I'll explain why we do this later, okay? But for the time being, the first number or numbers you use must be the cut points. So we're going to plug in negative 4. We're going to use negative 4 for X. Now, to label cut points, they're either going to be open dots or regular closed dots. You're going to use the same rule you used for uh, the solution cut point, uh, the solution cut points on the cut point method. There's no equality, so this cut point is going to be an open circle. Let's see. Zoom in. Okay. I'm going to zoom in a little bit right there. We'll zoom out as we need to, but right now I'm going to zoom in. Now we need another number. Y'all said that a line needs two points, so we need another number. My favorite number to use is zero, but is zero less than negative four? Can we use zero in the blue piece? No. You have to choose an x value that's less than negative four. Think of the x-axis. Choose a number to the left of negative 4, a number that's easy for you to uh, label on the x-axis and work with, and I heard one. Negative 5 is a good one. Negative 5, negative 6, negative 7. Think about the number line. You could use number negative 50, but do you want to count 50 units to the left? No. You can use any number less than negative 4. <laughs> now, is negative 5 a cut point? No. No. The numbers that you make up on your own or that you choose on your own, or just regular closed dots. That You're using an open circle here to say, hey, I'm plugging in negative 4, even though negative 4 is not less than negative 4. But negative 5, yes, it is less than negative 4. The numbers you choose have to satisfy the inequality. Therefore, the numbers you're choosing on your own have to be regular closed dots when you're drawing the graph. Plug negative 4 into the blue piece. What are we about to get? Okay, that's going to be a 3 plus a negative uh, 8, 2 times negative 4. I agree with negative 5. That's unfortunate that there's so many negative 5s popping this up. This negative 5 has nothing whatsoever to do with that negative 5. Did y'all see where we got the negative 5? We went 3 plus 2 times negative 4. That's 3 plus 2 times negative 4 is a negative 8. So 3 minus 8, sure enough, that gives me negative 5. Plug in negative 5. Negative seven. Let's see if you're right there. 3 plus 2 times negative 5. Oh, I think I agree with you. Yep, yep. That's 3 minus 10, so negative 7. We have two ordered pairs that uh, we can uh, plot on our XY grid. I'm going to make a table, a red table and a purple table, and then I'm going to draw the graph down here. We're going to have yeah. six points once it's all because, finished. Actually, but because you're going to have two pieces of lines. Okay. okay? Three pieces. I mean, three pieces of lines. Did I say two? I meant three. I'm sorry. But so I'm. Blue piece. Then a red piece. 
I need enough room for the two extra tables. So I'm going to draw my graph right down here. I'm thinking ahead and I notice that I'm going to have some numbers that are going to be way up here on the y-axis. So notice how I'm... I must show. Notice how I'm doing this. So, I have to clearly label those cut points. The cut points are negative 4 and positive 5. Label them here on the x-axis. 1, 2, 3. There's negative 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's positive 5. The numbers where the pieces are changing. You've got to see them clearly on the x-axis. The way this graph is going to look, we're going to have a blue graph over here to the left of negative 4. Between negative 4 and 5, what color graph are we going to have? Between negative 4 and positive 5. The blue piece is going to be here. What's going to be here? Red. The, the red, red piece, graph. that's right. And to the right of 5, what color are we going to have? The purple graph, right, okay. This is some really, really good graph theory. If you get the hang of this stuff, how to graph a piecewise function, you know an awful lot about graphing. Okay, so negative 4, negative 5. Well, here's negative 4. got to go down 5 units. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I have an open circle at negative 4, positive 5. Negative 5. I mean negative 5. Next, y'all said negative 5. We plugged in negative 5, and we got negative 7. So we go left 5 and down 7. Is that going to be an open circle? No. Negative 5 is not a cut point. It's going to be a dot. Just a regular dot as if you're graphing. You start at the cut point, and you start drawing. Think about this interval, x less than negative 4. You're on the x-axis, the numbers that are less than negative 4. Does that interval stop? Mm -hmm. It starts at negative 4. It goes this way. Does it stop? Mm -hmm. No. So you start at the cut point. Okay. It starts going, and it does not stop. You have arrowheads on one side, the left side. It starts at the cut point. It keeps going on the left side. People don't like those middle pieces, that red piece. People dislike those. Uh, and I don't know why, because I really like a piece like this. Okay. This red piece. You have to plug in the cut points. So you have to plug in negative 4. What else do you have to plug in? What's the other red cut point? Five. Five. There's no free will here. You don't choose a number on your own. You know I have to plug in negative four and positive five. So, mm -hmm. and wait, are they going to have open or closed? Open. Oh, wait, look at this. There's equal signs oh, there. Oh, well, yeah. But let's say yeah. they were like this. Then you'd have Without open the line. Uh -huh. Then they'd then be both open, open circles. Mm -hmm. They're not okay. yeah. mm -hmm. But notice there's equality. So the cut point negative 4 is going to be a closed dot. The horizontal line, the cut point 5 is going to be a closed dot. Any questions? You've got to plug in the cut point. The cut point. There's two red cut points. You plug in negative 4, that's negative 2 times negative 4, what's that going to give us? 8. Positive 8, okay. I'm going to they're all busy doing that. Plugging in 5 into the red piece, negative 2 times 5, what's that going to give us? Negative 10.
There's no open circles on the middle piece, are there? Because there's equal signs on both of these. There's equal signs on both of these pieces? I mean, both of those? So they're both closed circles. We go left four, up eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So left four, up eight, close dot. Now lift up. And now the next one, it's positive five. How far down are we going to have to go? Ten? Yeah, let's oh, see. Six, seven, eight, nine. Eight. I'll just continue my y-axis here. Oh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So right there. <laughs> it's hard to do this in black and white. It is hard to do it in black and white. I have a question for you. Are we going to have arrowheads on this red portion of the graph? And if so, on which side, left or right? Does this interval keep going and going forever in one direction? I saw someone shaking their head no, and I agree, it's not going to keep going. It starts at negative 4, it stops at positive 5. There will not be any arrowheads. Oh. You start there. The other one. Oh, there. It's oh. just a line segment. This thing here is called an open ray. A ray has an arrowhead on one side. And no, no arrowhead on the other side. If it starts at an open circle, it's called an open ray. If it starts at a closed circle, it's called a closed ray. But, but they don't need to know all that terminology. I mean, it's not. Well, I mean, they probably heard it some for you, though, yeah. in geometry classes. But this red piece is just a line segment. The interval starts at negative 4, it stops at positive 5, and that's it. It does not keep going in any direction. And but, so basically, if you can think about it, like all the dots are not going to have an arrow, and the circles are going to have them. Um, Is that right, right or no? The closed dots will not have an arrow on closed right. dots. And then the one with the circle, like the open well, circle. Here's what I remember: is that cut points can't have arrows at them. Negative okay, four was saying, the cut right. point. Negative four was the cut point. No arrow. Negative four and positive five. Those are the cut points, no arrows. When we plug in five down here to the purple piece, when we plug in five at the purple piece, we're not going to have an arrow there. But we're going to have to choose another number. And when you choose that other number, there will be an arrow there. You think you can put the purple right, right. here, Tim? What? I'm going to do that. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put the purple right here. Okay, so... Now the purple piece, are, oh, that was the second table, wait, there's the second table, and here's the third, so I'm making the third table now, okay, and we have to start with five, any number that appears in the inequality. Those cut points have to be used as the starting points. Open or closed when we plug in 5. Open because there's no equality. But we need another number, a number bigger than 5. Could I use 0? No. What number do you think I'll use? 6 is a good number. Don't use 10. Don't unless use 10 unless you're going to count, up, you're count up 30 units. That's right. So... Okay, that's, remember the uh, points that you choose on your own are automatically. You're not going to choose a number that doesn't satisfy the inequality. That's why the numbers you choose have to be regular closed dots. So plugging in 5 into the purple piece, what are we going to get? Wait a minute, I think you're looking at the red piece. 3 times 5, it's the purple piece. 3 times 5 is 15. I saw that as I was uh, 
uh, thinking about what this graph would look like, and I've realized, oh, we're going to need some big numbers up here. That's why I lowered that x-axis so much. Okay, 3 times 6, I agree with 18. So 5, 15, uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 19, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So we went right 5, up 15, we have an open circle. Then... 618. So we go one over from that five and up 18. I just barely had enough room. 16, 17, 18. That's a plain closed door. And then the arrow would go up. That's right. Okay. And one thing I was going to mention. You don't normally have arrows in the middle of a graph, do you? Arrows are always on the end. You're going to have one arrow on the rightmost right side, side, one arrow on the leftmost side. You don't side. have arrows in the middle of the graph, do you? I mean, do you normally have graphs where there's arrows in the middle? The arrows are on the ends. Another thing you'll want to notice, these compound inequalities, where the number is between two given numbers, you can't have an arrow on those. There's a definite starting and stopping point. But when it's just only one x less than or x greater than, then you expect an arrow on one side. If it's less than, the arrow's on the left. If it's greater than, the arrow is on the right. I'm reluctant to ask this. Any questions? I'm just reluctant because, oh wow, if there weren't some questions, then... Uh, I know, but, but... You'll sort of get the hang of this arrows and uh, open and closed circle. That, it's sort of like cut points. That's why we call these cut points. Right? You're changing from the blue graph to the red graph. The red graph is only between 4 and 5. And then the purple graph, bigger than five. Let's and look and see if we can figure out which graph. Uh, remember, it's multiple choice, so let's see oh, which yeah, one. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Let's look back at the problem. Hmm, let me Just see. Start. I'm going to start popping it out. Is that it? No, no clearly not. not. Let's see, is it B? No. 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 Is it... Which one? What about D? Is it D? No, no I'm thinking it's C. I think it's C. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, that works. That's Yeah. Oh, there it is. C. Check it. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Well, uh, we're still connected to the Ethernet. It's just that we were on the same problem. My lab wants to log us out after. It's not really my lab. It's the college's network. We weren't doing anything, so. Oh, yeah. Should have, uh... oh, is it next week? Really? Just. Really? X out. Just look and exit. Exit out. Please. And then go back. Oh, do you think it's going to say number? Oh, yeah, we got number six right. Okay. Yes, it gave us credit for there. it. Just Let's do number four now. Okay, wait. Yes, it gave us credit. We're right. Okay, now we're going to do number four. It's another graphing. Ooh, what do y'all think? Does it look easier or harder? So, is number four? Hard because there's, one less. there's just two pieces. <laughs> yes. The three piece ones are the hard ones, and if you can do that, you know a lot about graph theory. And uh, the two piece ones are going to be easy. So this one, you just have two pieces. What are you using? A purple piece for the first one. 
And for negative 5 plus 2x, that's a blue piece. Okay. Negative 1 minus x if x is less than or equal to 2. Negative 5 plus 2x if x is greater than 2. And switch over to my paper. Okay. How many tables of values are we going to need? Two. Just two, a purple table and a blue table. Now, y equals negative 1 minus x. And y equals negative 5 plus 2x. Y equals mx plus b. What do we expect those graphs to be? Lines, circles, parabolas. Oh, okay. They're going to be lines. Yeah. So we only need two ordered pairs. I'll make my first. Wait a minute. This will be piece one and piece two. How did you make that differentiation? Hmm? There's no exponents. No exponents. There's no exponents. It's a line. Circles have x squares and y squares, and circles are never functions. Keep in mind, these things are functions. functions. That so notation. And look at this graph we just drew. Regardless of how messy it is, it passes the vertical line test. You say, well, right here. They're at negative 4. Yes, it passes it because that's an open circle. There's not a point. You draw a vertical line there, it only hits at that red dot. But right here at 5, there's only one point, the red one. The open circle means not included. And you know something, before we go on, there's something I needed to discuss. Uh, why are we even plugging in 5? Y'all said that x can't equal 5 here, so why did I plug in 5 to get started? I think it's easiest, rather than looking at the blue piece, I think it's easiest right here. I claim that the real number system is dense. Between any two real numbers, there are infinitely many other real numbers. For example, between 5 and 5.1, there are infinitely many numbers there. If you doubt it, here's 5. 5, you can think of it as a 5.0 and a 5.1. Oh, I could put a 5.01. A 5.001, a 5.0001. You can just keep on sticking zeros before the one and do that forever. There are infinitely many uh, numbers between any two real numbers. Let's look at this situation right here. X greater than 5. Suppose I wanted to use something like 5.0001. Is that greater than 5? Yes. yes, just barely, but it is. So looking at this purple thing, if I wanted to use 5.0001, the y value, 3 times that, would be 15.0003. I just made a new ordered pair. 5.001 comma 15.003. Uh, I, oh, I, I think I'm missing a zero, aren't I? If we were going to plot this point... So this point is on the graph. It has to be on the graph. 5.0001 comma 15.0003. That's on this purple graph. If I told you, come and show me where that point is. When you look, when you point, I bet it's going to look like where you have that open circle there. That point zero 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 one and point zero 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 three. it really looks like just to the naked eye, if you were plotting that point, it would look like 515. So this open circle is saying exactly 515 is not on the graph, but there are plenty points that, that look, look like 515 that are on the graph. That's why you have to plug in those cut points even when there's no equality. Up here at negative 4, negative 4, uh, negative 4, negative 5 isn't on the graph, but negative 4.000001, comma, negative 5.000000, 
it would be a one also is on the ground. So the purpose behind these open circles, they're saying that exact point isn't on the graph, but there are infinitely many points right there by that open circle that look like the open circle, and they are on the graph. So now number four. Let's graph this one. How many tables are we going to need? Two tables, I agree. I'll start off with my purple table. What's the first number I'm going to plug in for X? Two. It's a cut point. Is it going to be open or closed? I heard both open and closed. It's going to be one of them, so which one? Look at this thing right there. There's equality, so it's closed. That little horizontal bar says it'll be closed. Now we need an X value less than two. Okay, one. You can use zero. I like zero. That's easy to plug in. Let's plug two into the purple piece. We're plugging in two. We're going to have a negative one minus two. What's that going to give me for Y? Negative three. Can you blow it up a little bit? Oh, there. Negative one minus two. I'm getting a negative three. So there's my first order pair. Plugging in zero. I don't think I have to show that. What's that going to give me? Negative one minus zero is negative one. And yes, remember the points that you choose on your own are automatically closed dots. You know, why don't we make both tables and then draw the graph? Let's do that. Let's make both of the tables and then we'll draw the graph. So this is going to be the blue table. This is table two. What's the first number I must plug in for X? Two, open or closed. Open because there's no equality, so I agree. Now we need an X value bigger than two. What do you think I'll use? Three. Is that going to be an open circle? That's going to be a closed dot. Any number that you choose on your own. Three is bigger than two. That closed dot is saying three satisfies the inequality. The open dot says two doesn't. Two isn't bigger than two. That open circle says you're plugging in a number that does not satisfy the inequality. But Plug zero, point zero, 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 one does. does. And so there are infinitely many points that will look like this uh, open circle that does satisfy the inequality. So plugging in two, we get negative five plus two times two is four. What's that going to give me? Negative one, I agree. Plugging in three, negative five plus two times three is but what, six equals a positive one. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to. You're right. So we have two negative three and zero negative one oh, as our purple ordered pairs. Minus. Yeah, and two negative one and three one for the blue piece. Oh, I like this. None of the numbers are that far apart. We don't have an 18 on the y-axis we have to worry about. Isn't it terrible the way I draw the wavy lines? Even when I have these nice grids here, look at that. Uh, oh. so the only cut point you label on the x-axis is positive 2. Okay, the pieces are going to change at 2. On we one have, side, we have a purple graph. On the other side of two, we have a blue graph. Two, negative three. Right two, down three, close dot. And then zero, negative one. Left, right, zero, down one. We start at the cut point. Two, negative three. 
If we go this way, does the graph stop? X less than 2, does that interval stop? No, it keeps going out here on the left side, so the graph keeps going on the left side. Now, 2, negative 1. Right 2, down 1. There's... Why does that look at arrows? Wait, this one? Yeah. X less than 2 on the x-axis. There's 2. All these numbers to the left of 2 are less than 2. Does it stop being less than 2? Okay. Going and going. The interval keeps going towards the direction of that little point. That's the left side, so the left side of the graph has an arrowhead. Now the blue one... Oh, wait a minute. I was looking at the wrong thing. Okay. Now the blue one. 2, negative 1. I have an open circle. Then 3, 1. That's a regular closed dot. Start at the cut point. Start at the cut point. Go towards that point that you chose. Does the graph stop? No. Once again, X bigger than 2, every number bigger than 2 that on the x-axis, the graph continues forever on the right, the right side of the graph continues. Any questions there? Mm -hmm. yeah. Any questions why this one's a closed circle and that one's an open? You're looking at the symbol up here. And notice 2, that's the cut point. You don't have uh, arrowheads occurring at the cut point. The arrowheads occur on the left-hand side of the graph and the right-hand side, not in the middle. If you continue drawing this purple graph, then it would fail the vertical line, line test. Yeah, it wouldn't be a function. It would fail the vertical line test. And we know this is a function how? Because of that notation right there. This is function notation. Any questions there? Okay. A, B, C, or D. I think we can clearly tell it's not A. Oh, yeah, not A. C. 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 Let me blow it up and we'll look. I think it's C. C. Go ahead and select that before we get timed out. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> well, I'll just do what I did earlier. I'm going to close it for a moment. Say leave. Go back over here, and it better have a check. Oh, it did. What did number was it? Four. We'll try it again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh. Nope. <laughs> okay. Hmm. That okay, one more oh one more graph. This is number three. We want a graph. F of X equals oh let's see. X minus two if X is less than or equal to negative 3. So X minus 2 if X is less than or equal to negative 3. And negative 5 if X is greater than negative 3. So you have a blue piece and a purple piece. Tony, why don't you take over right okay. now? I'm going to... Well, how many tables are we going to have? Two. two. We will have a. We have the cut point negative three. Uh huh. Y'all hear that? Very good. So this is for the first piece. We have negative three as a cut point, so you have to plug in negative three. Look at the symbol right off and decide open or close circle. Close. close. Okay. Now we also need to plug in another number. This is one where you choose a number less than negative three. Negative 
Negative four, that's a good one. Now, this will always just be a dot, the numbers you choose. So plugging in negative three for x, we have negative three minus two. Is that a negative five? And what's the other one gonna be? Negative four minus two, do y'all agree with negative six? Now the second piece is one of those where there's not an x in the little rule. It just says negative 5. That's called a constant function. Let's see how we graph that. Oops. Um, I think I messed up. I don't... Okay. Well, What's the purple cut point? Negative three. Negative three. Will this one have an open or a closed circle? Open. open, because there's not an equal sign. You'll call that with me. And then we need a number bigger than negative three. Negative two, negative, two, negative one, zero. Negative. I heard negative two, so first so I'll use negative two. And that's going to be a little closed dot. The only place you can have open circles is at cut points. In particular, we could say the only place you can have an open circle is at a cut point that doesn't have an equal sign on it. The purple negative 3 is the only place you can have a cut point. Excuse me, an open circle. Now, this is one of those constant functions. It doesn't matter what the x is. The y value is five. negative 5. Yeah, negative 5. Okay. Now, I'm going to draw my x-axis and y-axis. And I'm going to locate the well, negative three is what's changing. One, two, three. So let me just locate for negative three on the x axis. To the left of negative three, we're going to have this blue graph. So left three, down five. Left three, down five. One, two, three, four, five. Close circle. And then left three, excuse me, left four down six. That would be right out here. So I start at which one? I start at the cut point. Uh huh, and it starts going this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. so you're already getting there. Okay. So see, you start at the cut point, and then you just keep going and going. Negative four, negative five, negative six, so forth for x values. To the left of the number three, there should be a blue graph, and there is. Now, now the purple graph. Okay, we go to negative 3, negative 5, fully intending to label what sort of circle? Open. An open circle. We go there, and what do we discover? Okay, closed circles take precedence over open circles. An open circle says, hey, this point isn't on the graph. But yes, it is. It's on the point it's on the uh, blue graph. So closed circles. No, I said it backwards.
closed circles take precedence over open circles. I think that's what you said. Uh, is that closed what I said? Oh, okay, good. I started double check. I mean, uh, doubting myself. I thought I said it wrong. So, if you have an open and a closed appearing at the same spot, you use a closed circle. Then negative two, negative five, right there. Zoom in a little bit more. There. So it starts here, go into the right. Does the interval stop? Nope. Just anything bigger than negative three. Anything bigger than negative three, that's out that's here. Okay, what's causing trouble? Why is this? Well, because you have an arrow going that way because it's. Because x right. greater than negative 3 right. never ends. Right, and then so now you have something going that way doing the same thing. Notice something, unzoom it. When you're looking in terms of the arrows, that little point is saying the left side has the arrow. It's pointing towards the left, the left side of the graph keeps going. This thing here, that's saying, pointing towards the right. The right side is the side that keeps going. Oh, uh, okay. I was like, now, so confused. When you're doing the graphs with uh, different colors, you could sort of do something fancy if you wanted to not do a, it's hard to tell. If you wanted to try to do a purple open circle there and a blue closed, but well, that's right, not going to be how you show it. That's not how it's going to be done on the multiple choice. So. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, so. And we can't check login and let's start. So we're ready for quadratic functions. So there are two topics here in this section, piecewise functions and quadratic functions. Piecewise, there's no graphing tool. You're just graphing it on the paper the way we were doing and then choosing the correct graph. Now, for quadratic functions, we're going to get one of the nice, fancy graphing tools. Which and y'all love so much. Well, I think I like them, but I don't think, that's, I don't, I think the students prefer the uh, plain old multiple choice. Mm -hmm. But we're going to do, uh, yeah. let's see, uh, I think before we, mm. no, before we start graphing, so at this point, we're starting the second part of the assignment. There's two things we're doing piecewise functions and quadratic functions. So we're starting quadratic functions. But before we jump into this, uh, yeah, we need to write a little stuff down about quadratic functions. We already know that quadratic means x squared. ax squared plus bx plus c. Hey, you want to take out the sure. Okay. So what we're doing, starting with problem seven, we're graphing functions that look like this. AX squared plus BX, F of X equals AX squared plus BX plus C. Remember a quadratic equation is AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero. A function, instead of a zero, it's the function notation equals the quadratic expression. And the graph of a quadratic equation is a U-shaped figure called a parabola. They can either be opening up or down. And you might think to yourself, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Couldn't it open left and right? And if you're thinking that to yourself, great. That's a good question to be thinking. And you answered it. During that horrible class last Wednesday where everything was going wrong. There was a problem last Wednesday. It said, find, or is this a function? This thing right here. This thing. Here's a parabola that's opening right. Was it a function? No, no because it didn't pass the vertical line test. The rest of the semester, all we're interested in are functions. So are we going to be dra graphing things like this in this assignment? No. We're only going to be graphing parabolas that open up or down. 
Now, when you look at the equation of a, a, a quadratic function, parabolas open up if that first number, a, the coefficient of x squared is positive. That's what a greater than zero means. If a is positive, the parabola opens up. If a is negative, a less than zero, it's going to be opening down. Just knowing that, you know a lot about the function. But problem number nine, we're not ready to do it yet, but um, how is it going to open when we crack it? Is it going to open up or down? How do you know? That's a good question. It, the A is positive, so it's opening up. Okay, that's what I'm saying right here. If this number in front of the x squared is positive, it opens up. If this number in front of the x squared is negative, it opens down. Well, greater than zero means positive, and less than zero means negative. So I was just doing lazy. Instead of writing A is positive, I wrote A greater than zero, meaning A is positive. Instead of writing A is negative, maybe I should have done that out of laziness, I wrote A less than zero. Now, every parabola has what's called a vertex. That's the turning point. the vertex. How many fun or how many points do you think you need in order to graph a parabola? Three. three. One of them has to be what? It can't just be three random points. One of them must be the, the vertex. vertex. Yes. Okay. Our strategy for graphing these will be to find that vertex and then get a point on either side of the vertex. That's how you would do it if you were graphing it by hand. These things are uh, symmetric. The left side is the, ah, what did I just do? The left side is the mirror image of the right side. So what we're gonna do when drawing using this new uh, graphing tool, they'll have you <laughs> find the vertex and then just one other point and then they'll automatically you know, use the, the symmetry point. to make it, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the left side, side, the mirror image th of the right side. So, really, we'll only need to find two ordered pairs, the vertex and one other point. Now, if you could imagine a vertical line drop going straight through the vertex that cuts the graph in half, that's called the axis. A vertical line that passes right through the vertex and cuts it in half. Could y'all draw a green axis right here? If you could fold the paper down that line, the right-hand side would be the mirror image of the left side. It would just lay right on top of it. That's, uh, it's also referred to as the axis of symmetry, but over the years it's just been shortened to axis. We're going to have something called the vertex or axis formula. Here's a formula that's going to let you find the x-coordinate of the vertex and the axis all at once. It's not a hard formula. x equals, I wonder if y'all, do y'all remember that quadratic formula? How does the quadratic formula start off? Negative b. Negative okay, b. Just... okay, negative b plus minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over what? Two o. Okay, it's the the quadratic formula without that messy plus minus square root. All of that it's just Low negative b two. on top and two a on the bottom. Mm -hmm. but, to make it look good. And here's something I like to mention: when a parabola is opening upward, the vertex corresponds to the lowest point on the graph. That means the <coughs> smallest y value is right there at the vertex. So when a parabola opens upward, 
the y value of the vertex is the minimum y value. The minimum y value occurs at the vertex when the parabola is opening upward. Now what's the corresponding M word that I'm going to write right here beside the vertex when it's opening downward? It starts with the M, but it's not minimum, it is? No? Okay, do you agree that this point right here that I'm pointing at has, it's the highest point on the graph, so it has to have the biggest Y value possible? Maximum. Okay. Yeah. We can okay. talk about a minimum and a maximum. So the minimum occurs at the vertex when the parabola is opening upward. The maximum Y value occurs when the parabola is opening downward at the vertex. The maximum occurs at the vertex. Now, in order to graph these, using the graphing tool, mm -hmm. We're only going to plot two points. If you want to plot three, okay. You can make a table with three, three. points, but don't but let me let you use two points. The first point will be the vertex. You've got to plug in the minus B over 2A. Once you calculate that number, that'll get you one point. Then any other number, whatever number you want to use, that's pretty close to this number here. I would say don't move two units away from that vertex. Because if you were doing this just by hand, you could use any number, but remember you're gonna have to, your graph has to fit on the little XY grid that my lab gives you. I always like to plug in zero, but there's one problem where if I plug in zero, I'll get something like 40 as a Y coordinate. It isn't going to let me plot the point 0, 40. So mm -hmm. once you find the vertex, choose a number within two units of the vertex. You'll see what we mean when we look at a graph. Now, when you're drawing these uh, parabolas, it doesn't matter if they're opening uh, up or down. Do they keep going to the left and right forever? Yes. yes. The last time... We said if you have a function with no fractions and no square root, the domain is all real numbers. The domain of any quadratic function is always negative infinity, comma, infinity. But the range, right. you're going to have to look at the graph and make a decision based on whether the vertex y value is a minimum or a maximum. Mm -hmm. So we'll say for the range, look at the graph. Range? It's not, and we'll illustrate what we mean by look at the graph when we're doing an example. But like right here, this one, if it's opening up forever, I mean, if it's opening up, it's going to go up forever, but it's not going down forever, is it? So if it's going up forever, the range is going to have an infinity in it. If it's going down forever, the range is going to have what? A negative infinity. But you just sort of have to see at this point, I think we're ready to do one of these problems. Let's do number nine. Seven, eight, nine are all the same type of problem. Number nine has the messy numbers or messier numbers. They're not that bad. They're still... There's still integers, so I know. it's not. Yeah. So we have f of x equals 2x squared plus 16x plus 30. Let's graph this function, give the vertex, axis, domain, range. I know the answer for domain. I know the, no square roots, no fractions. What are we going to have to type? We're not ready to do part C, but when we are, what are we going to type in for domain? Negative. Flip on it. Negative infinity or positive infinity. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Okay. okay. Now, let's start off by finding the vertex. Let's plug into this vertex formula. And remember, A, B, and C are just like with the quadratic formula. A, B, 
Yeah, we don't need C. We don't even need C for the for this formula. Mm -hmm. It's x equals minus b over two a. So minus what? Oh yeah, so negative 16 on top, uh-huh, all over 2 times a, so what's the x-coordinate of the vertex going to be? Negative 16 over 4, is that a negative 4? Okay. Now that's the x-value of the vertex. The vertex should be an ordered pair. So how do we find, or what are we going to do to get the y value? Just plug it in. X, y. If we plug negative 4 in for x, you want to use the calculator, Tim? Sure. That way we can be sure to show on these parentheses for us. Okay, I'm plugging in negative 4 for x. It's 2. Oh, heck, let me reset it. Everything I know. Mm -mm. Okay, good. But I'm going to start doing it by hand. 2. Oh, good. Left parentheses. We plug in the 4. Negative 4. Oh, negative 4. Huh. Okay, wait. Do I want to go back? Yeah. Back uh huh. And just say, insert. Oh, just say negative four and type it in. Square, square right there, plus sixteen times negative, negative four. four. How many of y'all have already done? Plus thirty. So that would be uh, thirty-two minus sixty-four. That's a negative thirty-two. Plus 30, I'm getting a negative 2. Let's see. Yep, sure enough. So there's our vertex. Negative 4, negative 2. Write it out. Vertex. Vertex. Okay, good. See, that formula only gives you the x coordinate. Yeah, this is a, I'm going to stop using that red. It's hard to read. Now, what's my favorite number? If I'm choosing a number to plug in, what's my favorite well, we can number? Go ahead and Zero is my favorite number to plug in, but if I do, what am I going to get for Y? Zero one thirty. I bet you anything, they're not going to let us count up 30 on the graph. Don't move more than two units away from this vertex value. That way you'll be sure that your point uh, fits on the graph. So we could use negative three, negative two, or we could use uh, negative 5 and negative 6, and we should still be okay. But don't move a long distance from that negative 4, or else you're going to get a Y value that won't fit on your graph. So what do y'all want to plug in for X? Need... We're using a calculator anyway, so it's not like it's that hard. So. Three. Negative 3? Negative 3, okay, here goes. 2 times negative 3 squared plus 16 times negative 3 plus 30. That gives me oh, a y value of 0. Okay. So, if you look at the problem, I think it asks you to state the vertex. That's, we've done a little more than just right there. Okay. Filling in the vertex, it's got to be an ordered pair. Okay, that was parentheses negative, negative four, four, comma, negative, negative two. two. Okay. Now it wants you to graph it. So move that calculator. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Oh. Huh. Okay, wait. Uh, make it smaller. Now, okay. oh, that really helped a lot. Exit okay. out. Let's Exit count. out. I'm going to use this graph here. Tony's the one that likes to pop out those graphs. I'm just going to use this form here. Okay. okay. When I click over here, you'll notice here's my toolbar. Well, 
can you see the Can you tool? see that little uh, where I'm pointing? It says vertical parabola tool. Oh no. Okay. And there's two dots. They have the little vertex that's a blue dot. And then they have a secondary point that's a blue dot. So that's a two-point vertical parabola tool. Lovely. So click this thing. And, oh, it blew it up. Mm -hmm. It did? Mm -hmm. It was already gone. No, it doesn't. It, it's not given the instructions. Yeah, if you don't play with that. I that guess time. I'll have to use this. Oh, that looks better. That looks better. Now okay. let's try to uh, blow that up like no. that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so we click the vertical. Oh, there it is. Notice, I'm going to X this all out. And we start said off. that it's going to be a, uh, we're going to blow this up. It's a vertical parabola tool. And it says, click the graph to plot the vertex. You have to plot the vertex first. first. That vertex was negative 4, negative 2. Remember, when you pop this graph out, notice how it's showing you the points right here in this yellow box. So when you're having a hard time counting, just keep your eye there in that yellow box. Is that the point I want? Yep. Yes. Negative. So I click the vertex. Now notice what happens as I start moving the mouse around. It's drawing every possible parabola with a vertex at negative 4, negative 2. Notice the instructions. They say plot another point. Well, what was the other point we were going to use? Negative 3, 0. Negative 3, 0. Is that it? Yes? Notice the way it reflects it. When you plot one point, it flips it over and gets the other half. We're plotting the right-hand side, the... Uh, it used the tool. that symmetry to draw in the left side for you. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of that absolute value graphing tool that we used several weeks ago. So there's the graph. Check your answer. But we're not through. They want the axis. Okay. Well, maybe they should have asked for the axis first because you got to find the axis in order to know where the vertex occurs. But it's an equation. Look at how we wrote that thing. X equals. For the axis, you're X not just. equals negative 4. Yeah, you don't just write negative 4. You write the equation. X equals negative 4. Okay. So. X equals I negative wonder if you'd four. written just negative 4. Would it, is it smart enough to say, hey, wait, uh, you have the right number, but what's it going to say? Is it just going to say wrong? No. Nope. Nope. Okay, it just says wrong. So type in X, X equals. Okay. The domain, I said we knew that. We could have written, typed this in immediately. All quadratic functions have domain, all real numbers, negative infinity, comma, infinity, right parentheses. Now, the range. The range. Remember, for the range, we said you have to look, where is it? Right here. Range, look at the graph. So you have to analyze the graph to decide on the range. Those are the y values. Can you just really quickly explain why the domain is that? I know you did oh, that. Well, there's a couple of ways you can look at it. The domain is asking, is the graph going left and right forever? And if it's going up like this, it's going left and right forever. It's spreading out slowly. Uh-huh. Now, but remember we said you want to avoid square roots, so you want to, I mean, square roots and negatives, you want to avoid denominators of zero. On number 15, the last time, during the horribly messed up class, we said if there's no square roots and no fractions, the domain is always all real numbers. Negative infinity, comma infinity. Okay? okay? Now, let's look at the graph for problem uh, for this one. Oh, gosh. I'm going to blow this up some. Is the vertex oh, corresponding to a maximum or a minimum? 
minimum. Look at the Y values. Are there any Y values? Like, is there a, what's the smallest Y value? No, the no. smallest Y value, the lowest point. Oh, negative four. Wait, negative four. I can't. Negative. Blow it up once more. Negative. I think that's a negative two. Okay. Blow it up. Blow it up. You know something? Day. I think let's try it like this. And then, okay. okay. Here goes. I'm going to hope I don't mess things up. There. Okay. Is the Y value negative two there? Yeah. This, that is the smallest Y value on the graph. Negative 2 is the smallest Y value on the graph. The graph is going up. Does it stop? No, it keeps going. Is there going to be a point on this graph where the Y value is a million? Yep, way up there. There's going to be a point. There's going to be two points where the Y value is a million. So, if we were writing it out in words, I'd say the range is all real numbers greater than or equal to negative 2. So, but we're not writing it in words. How do we write that in uh, interval notation? Remember, you have to go small to big. So, so the smallest Y value is negative 2, I agree. And what's the biggest Y value? Infinity. Infinity. Now, always put parentheses by infinity symbols. And we're going to put a bracket at negative 2 because there is a point at negative 2. The vertex has the y coordinate of negative 2. Negative 2 is used as a y value. Now, y'all were having a hard time trying to figure out what that y value was. And it was negative 2. Where did negative 2 occur out here? Right there in the vertex. Right there. That y coordinate of the vertex is going to be important for determining the, the range. range. That y value will either be the maximum y value or the minimum y value. Oh, Tim, now it's way too small. Okay. So come down here to the range. Oh. Bracket. Negative 2, two. comma. Infinity. Any questions there? Um, and the negative. range will always have a bracket because that number in the range is going to be part of the vertex. It'll be the white corner of the vertex. And that means that number is being used. It's being used right there at that vertex point. Yes, there's a point right there at it. It's hard to see it because there's numbers. There's so many little bars on the graph and so forth. I think we need to do another one of these graphs. Okay, so you want to go to number eight? That's what I was thinking. Okay, let's do number eight. You uh, notice that uh, a value was positive on number nine. The number in front of x squared was positive, so we knew the graph was going to open upward. Let's look at number eight. No, let's look at number seven. Seven. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's do number one. seven. Number I wanted seven. to do, why did I want to do, why did I say do seven instead of eight? Negative. Yeah, I wanted one where it was opening downward. Look at it, number eight. It was going to open up. It's still going to open upward. That's an assumed positive one in front of the x square. A positive a value, it opens up. Question? It's going to be an upside-down parabola. Yeah, we're doing there. this one. This is the one we're doing, number 7. f of x equals, I wonder if anyone can tell me what the answer to the domain is. All real numbers? The negative, negative infinity, infinity, infinity. infinity. Right. Okay, I don't think these numbers are going to get so large. Wait a minute. Earlier, uh, there. That's easier for you all to see. Oh, oh, switch over. Oh, uh, there. Well, there. Okay. Just to, uh, to use that vertex formula, let's make a note that A is negative 1 and B is positive 4. C is a negative 5, but uh, we're not really using that. So x equals minus b over 2a. Good. 
the minus b, that would be a minus 4, negative 4, is that what I heard? Mm -hmm. What about the 2a? Negative 2. So negative 4 divided by negative 2 is positive 2. Let me draw my xy table here. Okay, so we're going to plug a 2 in. That's going to give us the vertex. Uh, okay, now we've got to find the Y. So, here we go. Notice how I'm patching this in. Negative. Now I'm ready to plug in that X value. So I'm enclosing that X value in parentheses. Am I going to square that negative? No. Is this negative being squared? No. No. So the 2 is enclosed in the parentheses and it's being squared. So that'll be a 4. But then that negative in front will make it a negative 4. Plus 4 times negative 2. No, it's a positive 2. Oh, it is a positive 2. Oh, goodness. Minus 5. To give me a y value of negative 1. We have negative 4 plus 8 minus 5. Negative 4 plus 8 would be a 4 minus 5, negative 1. What's my favorite number to plug in? Zero. zero. I think we can use zero. It's close to that x value. Plugging in zero, what are we going to get for y? Okay. You see, one, why I like to plug in zero for quadratic functions Every term that has an x goes to uh, 0, and the c value, that constant, is the y coordinate. But for that other one, we couldn't have used that 0 because it gave us a y value of 30. Mm -hmm. So let's come over it's, here. Would it see? Would it have fit on the graph? Oh, it no? would not have Oh, okay. It went up to so, 40, if I so type in the ordered pair, 2 comma negative 1. Maybe... And now, there, whether the parabola is opening upward or downward, you still use the vertical parabola tool. Mm -hmm. I think we had a question about the, huh? if the vertex, um, so it's always going to be open in parentheses? Just the vertex is an ordered, ordered pair. pair. That's why you have the parentheses. Yeah. Uh -huh. I heard it oh, okay. Repeating. The, the ordered pair always has parentheses, and it that doesn't have anything to do with the open and closed circles that we were using earlier. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, oh gosh, you still click the vertical parabola tool, even though this graph is going to open down. You click the vertical parabola tool. It says to click the vertex. The vertex was at 2, negative 1. Oh, Tim, it, we oh, can't see that. That was the problem with drawing it up. Oh. There and there. Oh, well, still what's not. happening? We exit out. We click the vertical parabola tool. The vertex was at 2, negative 1. And then it says... Plot one other point. Right now, I'm drawing every uh, parabola possible with a vertex at 2, negative 1. But what was our secondary point that we found? Zero, negative uh, 5. Oops. Is that it? Yeah. Yes. Save it. Check answer. The axis. X equals that X coordinate 2. That number right here is used for the axis. So X equals 2. The domain. All real numbers. 
all a quadratic function is a polynomial function, and all polynomial functions have uh, the domain all real numbers. Tony, what are you writing there? I'm just oh, you're just writing out domain equals all real numbers. I thought you were going to write something really insightful. Okay. Always all real numbers. Mm -hmm. A domain of a quadratic function. Okay. And now the range. Remember, for the range, you have to look at the graph itself. I'm going to blow it up once more. You have to do it once more. That's it. Um, Okay, I agree with negative 1 and negative infinity. But remember, it has to go small to big when you're typing in interval notation. And so do you all write negative 1 comma negative infinity or the other way around? you got to okay. stick parentheses negative infinity comma negative 1 bracket. Okay, I was going to ask... Is the vertex a maximum y value or a minimum y value? It's the maximum y value. Notice that's the highest point on the graph. So the biggest y coordinate is that negative 1. And then every number out below there is being used. Hence, the range, parentheses, negative infinity, comma, what did I say, negative, negative one? 1 bracket. I remember years ago, a student asked me, she said, she wants to make up a rule, but she doesn't know if it's true. She asked, she said, can we make the statement that the axis will always have the x-coordinate of the vertex, and the range will always have the y-coordinate? And I said, yes, that's a rule. You could state that as a definite rule. The range will always have the y-coordinate in it. The axis will always have the x-coordinate. Okay? You could even make more, uh, more specific uh, uh, rule if you wanted to. If the parabola is opening downward, the range will be negative infinity up to that y-coordinate of the vertex. Negative infinity, comma. Oh, show what I'm writing. Okay. If the parabola opens downward. Mm. Let's separate that from this rule. I mean, from all that. Okay, if the parabola is opening downward, the range is always negative infinity, comma, y coordinate of the vertex bracket. Could y'all state a similar rule if the parabola is opening upward? Look at number nine. Then the range would, oh, let me write it down here. It would be y-coordinate of vertex comma infinity. That number there on the y-axis, and then the graph keeps going up and up forever. And that's what we saw on number 9. The lowest y-coordinate was negative 2. Negative 2 came from that y-coordinate of the vertex to positive infinity. Put it back. Any questions? Y'all sort of see what I'm trying to summarize here? Okay, if we're working with a quadratic function and they're asking you to find the maximum or minimum value of the function, the maximum or minimum value of a function of a quadratic function will always occur at the blank. Where do the maximum and minimum values occur on quadratic functions? The vertex. For the word problems in this section, they're all looking for maximum or minimum values. So I have a hint for you for these word problems. 
fine. Not, if you have, have no idea, a, a uh, oh, well, you're right. Okay. If you have no idea of where to start, and they're looking for a maximum or a minimum, find the vertex. vertex. That's a good start. To answer the uh, word problems, really, all you have to do. There's going to be three of them. Just do the minus b over 2a and plug it in. It, you know, these are the easiest word problems you'll ever do. Because there's, a, you know, what do you do? Minus b over 2a, plug it in. So let's do those three word problems. Mm. Oh, oh, wait, I forgot about this one. I forgot about this. Mm. It says, find the, oh. Oh, you can't see the negative. Okay, what's the trick? Help me solve it. Let's see if I can get a better, no, close it up. Ah, okay. okay. Well, well, it's not much better, is uh -huh. it? Here, there's no work to it. It just wants the minimum value of f of x is. Realize f of x is a fancy way of saying what letter? Okay. No. f of x is the y. y. So when you're looking at this graph, what's the smallest y value? One. 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 People have a tendency to think that the Minus b over 2a is the value of the function. No, that is the x value. The value of the function is the y value. We're trying to make a point here that the maximum or minimum is the y value, not the x value. And they do a very poor job at making that point because no matter what, that number will be a negative, and then the y value is going to be a positive of it. So, so type in a 1, and let's do it the, an example Yes, you make a graph. Okay. Well, you make one like that first. No, I just want to come on. Okay, number eleven. How much longer before this thing things is going to start uh, freezing up? Start freezing. So, number ten was just one. Just one. The, the y value of the vertex. Uh -huh, of the vertex. Uh huh. Now look at number eleven. A woman has a taco stand. She found that her daily costs are approximated by, so we have a quadratic function, c of x equals x squared minus 20x plus 620. So they're using a c for cost. Where c of x is, in do is the cost in dollars, to sell X units of tacos. Do we have any business majors in here? If so, if you have to take math 1324 or 1325, we're going to be calling these things a cost function, and you'll be working with them a lot. It says, find the number of units of tacos she should sell to minimize her cost. Okay, and what is the minimum cost? They don't ask us to draw a graph here, but look at that leading coefficient. Well, do you expect this graph to be opening upward or downward? Upward. Uh, upward. Hold on. And so if it's opening up, will it have a minimum or a maximum? Yeah. It's going to have a minimum. 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 That's what we're looking for. So just do x equals minus b over 2a, and then plug in, and you'll get the answers. So let's see, the B is a uh, negative 20, so we have negative, negative 20, that's a positive 20, over 2 times A, there's not a number in front of the X squared, but we know there's a 1 there, uh-huh, so 10. X does, is, that mean, oh. does that mean it's going to cost you $10 to... Run that uh, taco stand? No. Look, reading through the problem again, X is the number of units of tacos. Okay. I don't know if, surely it's not just individual tacos. Maybe a unit is a dozen. What do you think? But So her costs are going to be minimized when she sells 10 units of tacos. Now, what is that minimum cost? So we found the minus b over 2a. What are we going to do now? Plug it in. Plug I'm just going to write 10 tacos. Yes. Okay. okay. Now plug it in. And the notation that means plug it in is this. 
Let's remember function notation. You're plugging 10 in for x. So I'm just going to do this by hand. 10 squared would be 100. 20 times 10 is 200 plus 620. Hmm. 100 minus 200 is negative 100 plus 620. It looks like she's going to have to spend $520 to run that taco stand. And sell 10 units of tacos. So it's dirt, a unit of taco. It's certainly not just one taco. I don't even think it's three tacos. Because if it's costing her $520 to make those 30 tacos. Hopefully it's like a gross. Yeah. A gross of tacos. I'm getting hungry. Okay, so plug in the 520. Y'all see what I mean? You find minus B over 2A, then plug it in. The first number we got was the X value, the number of units of tacos. Then the Y value that we got when we, when we plugged in was the cost of operating the taco stand. Any questions there? What is that? I see number 12. Oh, it's that thing with the mosquitoes. The number of mosquitoes, M of X, in million in a certain area depends on the June rainfall X. In inches. So x is inches. The function that models that phenomenon is, oh, this one's a little tricky because of how it's written. The x square isn't written first. Sixteen. Did you say rewrite it? Oh. No, you can't rewrite it. Oh, why not? We can rewrite it. Mm -hmm. Or you could just, A, in order to do minus B, oh wait, find the amount of rainfall that will maximize the number of mosquitoes. I don't know why you would ever want to maximize the number of mosquitoes. And what is the maximum number of mosquitoes? You see, I have a whole problem with this because it seems to me the more it rains, the more mosquitoes there are. But here they're saying there's a maximum number of mosquitoes. And if it rains too much, I guess the mosquitoes are going to drown and die or something. So. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. You're right. So, x equals minus b over 2a, but be careful. a is the coefficient on x squared. Okay, y'all tell me, what's the a value? Negative, Negative 1. one. And what's the b value? Remember, b is the number in front of x. 16. Okay. <laughs> Any questions on our logic? A isn't just the first number that's written. It's the number in front of x squared, and that's a negative 1. And then the B value is the number in front of x, so 16. So let's do minus B over 2A. That'll be a minus 16 over what? Negative two. Since this is the number of inches of rain, we better get what sort of number is an answer, positive or negative. Okay. It we better, better be positive. positive and, it, and we did. That was true up here also. You better not have gotten a negative number of tacos. Right? And so, eight inches. It looks like if there's eight inches of rain in June, the number of mosquitoes is maximized. If there's nine inches. Mosquitoes are going to start dying off or something. I don't know. That just seems uh, that seems a little far-fetched to me. This is just a math problem, an algebra problem. Don't you know? Don't assume there's science based on. Uh, okay. What is the maximum amount of mosquitoes? What are we going to have to do there? Plug it in. Plug in the eight. Sixteen. Eight. And eight. Uh, 128 minus 64. It looks like there's going to be 64 million mosquitoes in that area. So 8 inches of rain will create 64 million mosquitoes. I'll just do that. I have a 
They're just making up. It's just the, 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 don't lodge it. Okay? Yeah, don't apply uh, any sort of scientific <laughs> knowledge or anything like that to these word problems. Okay, so we come over here. What am I going to type here? Sixty-four. That's right. Sixty-four. That can be. Will there ever be a hundred million mosquitoes in June in this area? Oh, oh, no, 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 no matter what, so 64 million is the absolute maximum. You sound like our sister. She moved down here from Dallas, and so bad. she, Dallas has all that wonderful car exhaust that sort of kills the mosquitoes. But so. 13. If an object is projected upward from ground level with an initial velocity of 128 feet per second, then its height in feet. After t seconds, so t is the number of seconds. And t is acting like x. Mm -hmm. t is the uh, number of seconds, and t is the thing that's acting like x. Oh, at least they have it written in the correct order. Negative 16 t squared plus 128 t. They want us to find the number of seconds it will take to reach its maximum height. And then what is the maximum height? Yes. So the first thing they want us to do is find t, the number of seconds, and then find the maximum height. Let me switch over, Tony. Minus b over 2a. So let's see. What's b? So it's a negative 128 over 2 times a. 2 times negative 16 is, is that a negative 32? So negative 128 divided by negative 32, it better be positive. 4. Is, positive 4. I recall in the past, this has been things like 4.5 or 3.5. <coughs> so, so it's just a coincidence this goes in evenly. If it's it a, didn't, give it as a decimal. decimal. Okay, because it is, you're right. I'm glad you mentioned that to me. So, so this object, this projectile is shot up in the air. It goes up for four seconds. It reaches its maximum height. And then what does it do? It falls back down to earth. So the maximum height occurs after four seconds. Let's plug in four to see what we're going to get. Hey, you want to use your calculator? I am. Okay, so. Gosh, I just want this. This is going to sound terrible. I just want this class meeting to get to end so everything will work out okay. We may have had a little Look bit of this. internet problems, but uh, Tim White, what is this answer minus? Oh, let me clear it off. So I'm trying to make a mistake here and see if anyone spots me. Oh. Negative 16. Oh, well. You see, oh, oh, okay. You as soon as I do that, okay. You can't use that. That's subtraction, not negative. Remember, if you're using a TI calculator like this, there is a, a dedicated negative sign, and you cannot reverse the negative, I mean, interchange the negative and the minus anywhere along the way when you're punching this stuff in. So that's going to be negative 256 plus. 128 times 4. Six, five. Okay, so 256. Negative 256 plus 512 gives us a positive 256 feet. So that projectile went in the air for four, four seconds, seconds, reached a maximum height of 256 feet, and then fell back to Earth. So Functions like this have applications in physics, and they're called position functions. For the obvious reason, they give the position and of an object. And it's standard that a position function is labeled S. Don't ask me why, rather than P. But so that's just standard notation. Four seconds. 256 feet. Oh, wow. Uh, what's it to 14? We're just uh, reviewing something, probably a quadratic formula problem. Or oh, find the, the domain. domain. Okay. 
I, I, I remember that. Yeah, we did one. Yeah. Do not use a crafting calculator. That we did that stuff in the. We did a problem like that in the horrible class meeting on Wednesday. Okay, stuff. any questions? I thought it was a pretty good. I I enjoyed that class. Well, I like everything being a. And go ahead okay, and stop it. Okay, any questions, y'all? Did you? What did you say about the last part about?